The Advancing Women in Sport podcast is created on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to Elders past and present. I also celebrate the massive contribution that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island peoples have made to sport, and I acknowledge their contribution across the world. Hi there folks, my name is Michelle Redfern and I am your host of the Advancing Women in Sport podcast. I'm so thrilled to bring you season two and I've called it The Boys Club, stories of people who are smashing the patriarchy in sport. If you haven't yet caught up on season one, please do because there's eight amazing stories from eight amazing women who are working in sport at all levels and in all sorts of roles. And they've shared with us their lived experience and we've taken a lot of lessons and have given you some actionable insights about how to close the leadership gender gap in sport. However, in season two, I'm lifting my eyes and lifting my focus to the whole system of sport. I know from the work that I do with clients in both the business and sport areas that it's important to fix systems and remove barriers that prevent women from all walks of life, from all ages and stages in all sports on and off the field. I know it's important to remove barriers for those women to be successful. So my guests on season two are diverse. They are people of different genders. Uh, They're in different geographies. So we've gone beyond Australia this time. And of course, different parts of the sporting sector. What season two guests all have in common is that they are agitating, advocating and activating for gender equality in sport. I'm thrilled. I can't wait for you to hear their stories. Welcome back listeners to the Advancing Women in Sport podcast. I'm excited to be talking again to one of my friends in sport today, a woman who is like so many of my other guests, really thinking at a system level about sport and about how we can break down or bust through those barriers that have prevented women and girls from achieving their full potential in sport. So today I'm talking with Kerry Harris. And Kerry, you do a whole bunch of different things. I think some of us call ourselves, you know, we have portfolio careers, or you've just talked about preferment, uh, which is, I think, a really, really great word. But for background, folks, Kerry and I shared a state at one stage. So we were both in Western Australia. And when I first started looking around, particularly in the Australian rules football system for other senior women, I came across Kerry because at the time she was the CFO at the, the WA Football Commission. And I thought, aha, there's a woman who's in the C-suite, in footy, in sport, and I need to get to know her. So I relentlessly stalked her and, and here I am still stalking her seven or eight years down the track. But you don't do that anymore, Kerry. You do a whole bunch of other things. So welcome to the pod and perhaps you can introduce yourself and tell our listeners the many things that you actually do. Thanks, Michelle, and thanks for um, inviting me onto the podcast. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. I think my main role at the moment in sport that I think is is making a difference, I'm the chair of Women On Side. Women On Side is a member organisation that advocates on behalf of women in football and women's football. And I'm talking about the round ball game, folks. So soccer, football. So where we started with Women On Side was in 2017, a group of women realised There wasn't a dedicated voice for women in football or women's football that was joining in the discussion or influencing the discussion during the um, governance issues with FIFA and Football Australia. So Women on Side was born at that time. Well, I am a proud member of Women on Side, even though if you held me down and asked me to talk about the rules of soccer, I would be... I'd fail miserably because, as you know, I'm a I'm an Australian rules tragic, but I'm a women in sport fanatic. So women on side for me, and for listeners who have heard earlier episodes, you'll know that I interviewed the terrific Moya Dodd, who's been such a, a mover and a shaker and a role model for so many of us in soccer or the round ball game and more broadly. But I guess women on side, when I saw this initiative spring up, Kerry, and you involved with it, I thought, gee, this is exactly what I want to know more about and get involved with because we so often see that the women's game or women's interests are kind of 
patched on the side of the games that have been built for and largely occupied on and off the field by men since the game started being played. So tell us a bit more about, I guess, the pillars that you're focusing on and what have your early wins been? The biggest win that we had, and back, that was back in 2018, so Women on Side successfully lobbied for the inclusion of the 40-40-20 rule into the Football Australia Constitution. So for your listeners, if they don't know what the 40-40-20 rule is, what it means is that on your board or your committee, 40% of the members need to be men, 40% need to be women, and 20% other Women on side was a really strong voice and we achieved that inclusion into the Football Australia Constitution. And in addition to this, there was a requirement put into the Constitution for gender diversity in the chair and the deputy chair role. So, for example, if the the chair is a male or a man, then the deputy chair must be a woman and vice versa. So if we fast forward to 2022, we have five women on a nine-person board at Football Australia with Carla Wilshire as the deputy chair. And fast forward even again, we know that Football Queensland have now put the 40-40-20 rule into their constitution. So that was an early win. And you talk about changing the system. That's one way that we're influencing the system or what I like to say is disrupting the system, interrupting it. By getting that 40-40-20 rule into the constitution, it means you have more women in decision-making roles. And that's how you start changing the system, I think. Yeah, couldn't agree more. And again, referring back to my conversation with Moya, we talked a lot about Title IX in the US and these really systemic changes that that will create that sustainable change, but they'll create not change for change's sake or numbers for numbers sake. We know that organisations outperform when they have a diversity of gender, culture, ability and disability, all of the many facets of diversity. When you started that lobbying process, and I think this is where lobbying and advocacy is is so important. I always say, get behind things, folks, show up and, and turn up because with volume comes voice and with voice comes change. So when you first started that advocacy process around the 40-40-20 rule, what was the resistance that you encountered and how did you and women on side manage and mitigate that resistance? Mm, it's a really good word, Michelle. And the other one we, we use as well is backlash mm. as well, backlash to women who are making a difference. What commonly comes up when you're advocating for, for change like the 40-40-20 rule is, well, we select on merit. Selecting on merit is a myth because, as we know, the system was built by men for men And so how do you get women into a system that excludes them? And I'll give you a really good example. In 1921, the FA in England banned women's football in a knee-jerk reaction to its popularity, outright banned it, and that put women's football back decades. So let's unpack that a little. At the heart of it, the ban was a decision. FA used their power to make a decision. So where are the decisions made? They're made in the boardroom. Some made in the back rooms <laughs> as well. So women need to be where the decisions are made. That argument of merit popped up. And so you just keep going back and saying, well, the system didn't allow the women to get that merit, to earn that merit or even have a chance to be a part of it. And then also there's always that argument, well, we can't find any women as well. I don't think they're looking hard enough when they say that. That's my typical response. Absolutely. So women on side started Elaine's List. I don't know, again, if your listeners would know, there's a a list called Emily's List for political candidates. And so we created Elaine's List in in honour of Elaine Watson, one of the doyens of women's football in Australia. And it's a list of talented women that we can produce and say to anyone when they say, we can't find anyone. Well, we've got Elaine's List. Here they are. They're ready to go. There's our very first, in fact, we've got two calls to action there because I do like this podcast to give people something to do. The first one is merit is a myth. I totally concur. Julie McKay, who was previously the head of UN Women in Australia, has written a really great article around the myth of merit. Merit is absolutely subjective. It is not objective. And if we're going to say we're going to hire on merit, what I want to do is say to people, okay, show me the list of what is considered meritorious, and then let's evaluate all of the candidates against that. So folks, first thing is if someone says we only select on merit, say, please show me the list 
list of meritorious characteristics that constitute an appropriate candidate. And the second one is when you're looking for a woman to come onto your board or your committee, a place where decisions are being made, please look at Elaine's list via Women On Side because there's a group of women there who are capable and credible and ready to make a difference. So I love that. Two very strong call-outs to our listeners straight away, Kerry. I want to take us back a little bit now and talk about your journey, particularly your journey of advocacy through sport. So first of all, I frame it up by saying that there's these four stages that many of us go through. The first one is oblivion. I actually have no idea what's going on around me. I don't know that you would have ever been in oblivion. But anyway, then there's the second stage of I'm aware that there's a problem here. I'm aware that women are underrepresented or are treated unfairly or whatever it may be. The third stage is outrage, a a status I am perpetually in. And the fourth stage is advocacy. And for some of us, we wander between outrage and advocacy or or our outrage fuels our advocacy. So for you, Kerry, when did you first move into the outrage slash advocacy zones because I think that's when we start doing stuff. Can you tell us about any aha moments or the, hmm, I'm seeing this and I really need to do something about it? Look, I think activism is a part of my DNA. I go back to my a moment in high school. Representatives from the Navy, blokes, all blokes, gave us a talk about careers in the Navy. And I asked why women weren't allowed to go to sea. And they just smiled at me. They smiled patronisingly at me. I was a teenager, right? But I knew I was being patronised. I didn't have a word for it, but I knew something was happening. And so inside I was furious. I thought, they're making fun of me. Why are they making fun of me? But outside I was silent because I think on some level I knew I wouldn't be heard and also, too, that I wouldn't be supported by the people around me. And that feeling has stayed with me and now I know what it is. And it is that fire in my belly that fuels me. I go back to that moment a lot because I think we need to change this. We need to change these reactions to these questions, you know, to stop the patronism, to smash the patriarchy, I think. I mean, I grew up in regional Western Australia, first on a farm and then in the Pilbara in a small mining town. And being outside and playing sport was what you did. I grew up in the 70s, Michelle. You didn't go home until it was dark or you were hungry. What I learned from that was independence. And from independence at an early age means you you learn to make decisions. You make your own decisions. And so when I started my career, decision-making came easily. I started making decisions and then you go back to those moments that shape you and they start coming together and you move through a whole range of emotions as well. I've moved from elation from a win to absolute despair and frustration and rage at, you know, what I see is injustice, yeah. As you were talking about the folks in the Navy patronising, I recall a quote from Dame Stephanie Spence who's, you know, very well-known across IT or STEM circles, English lady. She's you can always tell an ambitious woman she's got a flat head from being patted patronisingly on it throughout her life. So it's interesting because people do come up against obstacles, you know, and they become upset or outraged or pissed off or, you know, whatever it may be, but then you've turned that into action. There are people who shake their fist at the sky and then there's people who get on with it and start making changes. So you've decided throughout your life to make changes or to advocate on behalf of women, you know, on the field or off the field or in the office or or wherever it may be. It's important to recognise that when we do that, It is special. So have you ever stopped to kind of think, well, I am doing some really good things here. You know, I have really devoted my life to that advocacy, that outrage, that activism. Did you stop and consider that? Only recently, to tell you the truth. I think you're so busy on on the path and working, you know, incredibly hard. I mean, my, my sport career has been spent as a CFO. And it's probably one of the most under-resourced parts of 
any organisation is that corporate services arm. So you're working incredibly hard. And I've worked a lot in male-dominated sports, so AFL, football, cricket. And being the only woman on the executive, you also have the weight of all women on your shoulders. So you get incredibly tired because not only are you doing your day job, but you're actually um, representing all women for all things. So there's sometimes there's little time for reflection. And so it's only been in the last few years where I've had the opportunity to reflect back on the achievements that I've made as a leader, but as also someone who's involved in uh, an organisation like Women On Side. And I think the main thing is, is actually being visible and being a role model for others to go, well, she's doing something, maybe I can do something. I struggle with articulating the achievements and I think perhaps that's common for a lot of people and I think particularly for a lot of women particularly in executive roles because you simply don't have time to reflect Mm, you're just cracking on you're just cracking on but you know you have moments you look at someone you go I influenced that person to do that that person spoke up because I spoke up and so there is sort of no big ticket achievements it's more about you know that you're in there you're in the mix you're influencing and people are taking notice and they're taking something on board that means something to them and then they're going on and doing something it's really interesting I gave an interview last week to a tech company that's using artificial intelligence to help counter the trolls on social media against women in sport And it's interesting because part of what you've just said has reminded me that, yes, you said when you're the only woman, you're representing all women. And that goes a couple of different ways because, you know, you do feel the weight of responsibility that I'm here representing all of the women in my my team, in my business, my organisation or my sport because I'm the only one here. There is a responsibility whether you choose to take that responsibility or not, but there's a responsibility there nonetheless. But I think the other one is that from the flip side, you're also representative of all women to non-women around the table. So how Kerry shows up is how we're going to judge all women. And that is an awfully big responsibility for one woman. And back to the interview that I gave last week, I said, you know, we've really got to start looking after trailblazers much much better. There are the women who go first. There are the onlys in organisations. And I think this brings me to my my second call to action for folks, which is when you see the only woman on an executive team or the only woman on a board or one of a couple, do reach out to her and help her not get accomplishment amnesia because you are so busy doing stuff for a whole bunch of other people. We do tend to forget the impact that we're having on others. But you know, so here's a call to action. If you're seeing a woman out there, she is representing all women. She is doing a hell of a lot of work. Give her a high five, a fist bump or a you know, send a nice note or a shout out or something like that because we just don't protect our trailblazers. And there's exhaustion that goes with, with some of that stuff. And you talked about some days you're elated, some days, you know, you despair. Let's really look after our trailblazers, those women who are going before us and helping the rest of us, I guess, benefit from or enjoy better conditions than we would have otherwise had she not been there. I love that, Michelle. I love that. Yeah, let's reach out to our trailblazers. I've done that occasionally. And it's reminded me I need to do it more often. And I love accomplishment amnesia. I love that. I've written that down. Yeah, well, I'm a big fan of reflection or reflective practices, however you want to do it. And certainly because I do a lot of work with women around leadership and running businesses, as you know, Kerry, because we've done some other work together. Part of that is I want us as leaders to stop, breathe and reflect from time to time and say, what's got me here and still serves me? What's got me here but no longer serves me? But what am I bloody well proud of? Because, gee whiz, I've got to hold on to that. Because you do have those days, right, when you go, man, I just want to stay in bed and pull the doona over my head because this is too freaking hard, that despair. When you are under duress, what do you do? Because you talked about pushback, backlash, you know, when you're trying to advocate for change. What do you do personally? And I guess this is a bit of a guide to... The other trailblazers and potential trailblazers out there, what do you do when the, the you-know-what hits the fan and you're feeling like, man, this is, this is too hard? 
I have a really good network. And so I, I reach out to my network. They're people who I, I respect. They're people who I trust. Sometimes I vent. However, most of the time, my network recharges my batteries and they remind me why I'm doing what I'm doing. Because you're right, it is easy to stay in bed and pull the doona over your head and go, oh, this is all too hard. When those moments happen for me, I reach out to my network of trusted people and just chat. And sometimes I may not even say what's on my mind. It might be just, hi, how are you today? And you're then reminded, surround yourself with good people, I think, and those people that you can talk with. And the other thing that I do is I stay the course. I start on something that is really easy. And it could be just a piece of work and you just keep working on it. And then that distraction takes you from despair to staying the course and doing. And then you're back on track again. They're the main things that I do. I reach out to my network and I just get started on something simple and keep going. And then it, I just get reignited again. Mm, I agree. And I think we know from research that being an only or an other in any kind of environment is tiring. It's emotionally and cognitively tiring because you're kind of, as Brene Brown says, you're armoring up. So when you can find that, you know, whether it's your personal board of advisors, your cheer squad, whatever you want to call them, you can drop the armor and just be and hang out. I want to bring this back around to women on side and groups like it. I think this is where the importance of the women's networking groups, and that's kind of a broad umbrella term to capture a whole bunch of different things, why it's so important for us to form them and have those environments for women to hang out in. So tell us what you're seeing through Women On Side and your other networking that can really help a listener. Perhaps if she's thinking, oh, I just, I don't do networking. I don't want to go and have to introduce myself to people, but it's just so much more than that, isn't it? So tell us about what Women On Side does to facilitate that kind of, you want to hang out with your cheer squad kind of thing and other groups that you've been involved in. So one of our pillars, apart from advocacy and being a membership organisation, is our networks. So we have a number of special interest groups. And I'll give you some you know, simple examples. We have a referees, special interest group, coaching, fan engagement, we also are looking to set up a state chapter in every state and territory around Australia. So we've got a Victorian chapter set up, run by the amazing Helen Tarikos. So those groups get like-minded individuals together to talk about a specific topic, and particularly with our referee group. I mean, referees, officials, match officials, I think it's a tough gig, and I think there's a lot that can be done in that space to protect the people who choose to to be an official or a referee. We set up a, a group where a networking opportunity, and we do we do most of our work online, where the, the women referees can come together and just share and talk about their experiences, talk about the challenges in a safe and open environment. It's almost like a support group. Another group that we're looking to, to work with is um, there was a, a club in Melbourne that was on the verge of folding because they just couldn't find any committee members. And so I worked with them and I just spoke with the president, the, the outgoing president. I said, you're not alone. There are actually about another eight or, or ten women-only clubs around Australia. How about we organise a, an online meeting where you can all get together and just talk about the challenges? So I think the main thing we do is we say you're not alone. You don't need to, to work on this alone. There are others out there who can support you and you can talk with them and just feel supported. So we've connected a number of women-only clubs who can all talk about the, the same challenges. So I think the message that comes out of that is that we let women in football know that they're not alone, that what they're facing and what they're feeling is not unique and that chances are someone has gone before you and has some great advice or can help in some way that ability to hang out with other folks. And, and you're talking about, I agree, around the officials, referees, umpires, what have you. Look, it's a hard gig anyway, let alone if you overlay gender onto it, particularly where you've got women umpires or refs in the male game. And they seem to attract, as we know, a whole different level of abuse, which is very, very gendered. I couldn't 
call out more strongly, listeners, if you're a woman in football who thinks, I kind of want to hang with like-minded people, even if it's just to top up your cup and get a bit of energy back and know that, you know, you're not alone. Find women on side and join one of the special interest groups because this is also part of that let's protect women with support systems so we don't lose them from the game. It's such an important part and and it's fun as well. So, And something else we've been doing, Michelle, is member roundtables. Now that we're allowed to travel freely again, I've actually been going around Australia meeting with our members and what I'm finding is that probably around 80% of the issues that they bring to the round table are the same. It's those systematic issues, not enough facilities, not being allocated, the the main pitch, getting hand-me-down strips. Then there's sort of 20% unique to each location. So, And I think that's really important is that ability to meet face-to-face as well. And again, so that people get to connect and you can start forming those links with someone else And then you can go, oh, I met that person. I now feel comfortable. I can give them a call and say, hey. Well, in the broader work I do around diversity, equity and inclusion, I'm I'm a big fan of a listening tour by CEOs and and chairs and things like that. And it's not a roadshow. It's actually a listening tour, which is what you've been doing. And I've been watching it with great interest because, you know, when you sit down and have a couple of reasonably broad questions and then let people talk, as you said, you start to hear that the matters that are important to women. It is frustrating, though, when I hear that women are still not getting the the pictures with the lights, they're getting second go at training, they don't get the medical staff assigned to their games, they don't get funding for uniforms, yada, yada, yada. So I think, you know, this is where this advocacy work and lobbying work, activism that Women On Side and other organisations do like that is so, so important because I think as a lay person, it could be easy to look back and look at the Matildas and the women in cricket and some of the, you know, the the things that are going so right, but it's not yet translating into certainly community sport. And even in some cases, I guess, rep level and state level sport, we're still seeing women struggling to be treated equally in terms of that equal opportunity, level the playing field quite literally for women. So that work's going to be really important. If you think about your individual goals, and then I guess more broadly, the collective goals that you have. So what are you aiming for now as an individual, but then I guess more broadly for women on side and and sport more broadly, Kerry, what's on your mind? Apart from the Matildas winning the World Cup next year, what I would like to see is accelerated investment in women's sport. I've been a CFO. I understand organisational budgets very well and I know that all organisations have discretion on how they allocate their resources and their budgets. So personally, pay inequity is something that I think about a lot and something that we think about at Women On Side as well. I'll share a story with you, Michelle. I went to the Women's World Cup in France in 2019 and I went to the final. I was in the merchandise queue and I could see the woman in front of me, a super fan from the USA. There's a fan group in the USA called the Outlaws. She had on the back of her T-shirt equal pay. So I tapped her on the shoulder and I said, hey, because I knew that she'd be part of a a larger group. I said, hey, why don't you start a chant at half time that says equal pay? And that was it. She was like really engaged she started tapping people on the shoulder and galvanizing people around her in her group and so I'm proud to say that I started the equal pay chant at the final of the Women's World Cup in 2019 that 60,000 people. Kerry Harris I did not know that no I saw that and I did not know you were the instigator of that well good on you that is fantastic I love it. As a a single person, you can make an impact. Now, I'm not saying you start a chant at every you know, opportunity. I think you've got to choose your moments. And the moment that I was thinking of was, well, this is the world stage. This is being beamed around the world. This is an opportunity just to make a statement at a point in time. There are times when you've got to be really loud, an antagonist in that way, and then there's the diplomacy route as well. There's talking to people, there's submitting papers, there's being a role model, stand up and speak out kind of thing. The advocacy work that we do is is sort of multi-pronged. 
we put on a lot of professional development for women in football and women's football. And we provide safe spaces for women to be able to, to talk freely, to talk about their challenges. I'm, oh, that is just so cool. <laughs> I can't believe how did I not know that? I'm going to bring this together because I think that was a really strategic move by you. Tap the shoulder. That is crowdsourcing on a, an epic scale, but you were strategic because you went, okay, this is the world stage. We're gonna, there's a lot of eyes on this and this is where we can start getting a light shone on a critically important issue and frankly, a disgraceful one that we still have to talk about, equal pay in 2022. So I guess the call to action for our listeners is work out what you stand for and then as you said, you, there's times to be loud and proud and be an activist, and then there are times to use the diplomacy route and advocacy and build relationships softly, softly, you know, that kind of stuff. I agree, it's a real skill, and a skill can, that can be learned in, in to know when to do what. Be loud and proud and also advocate at every opportunity. So apart from being very, very ambitious for the Matildas, what are you really hopeful for that you genuinely think is going to happen to level the playing field or to smash the patriarchy in sport in the next, well, in the next wee while? What I hope for is definitely equal pay. For me, that's a no-brainer. I've been in decision-making roles where I have made decisions about people's pay and I've paid people equally. It is within everyone's power to pay everyone equally. That is something that does not need any work. All it needs is a decision. What I'd like to see is accelerated investment in women's football, women's sport more generally. I'm saying accelerate the investment in women's sport because you have the ability to make that decision as well. So the heart of this comes back to decision making not just topping it up or doubling it or, or something like that, actually putting it ahead of the men's side of the game. The men's side of the game has had hundreds and hundreds of years of investment, whether that's money, whether that's resources, you know, that's exposure. So it's time to actually de-accelerate the men's side of the game and accelerate the women's side of the game. I would love to see that we didn't have to have quotas or percentages or anything like that, but that women in decision-making is just the norm and diversity in decision-making is the norm as well. And then the final one that I think about is, this is a new one, confidence erosion. And I think the whole concept that women aren't confident is a myth. I'm tired of hearing women don't have any confidence. Well, I don't know any women who don't have any confidence and I think what happens is that confidence is eroded. You think about the, the Grand Canyon. That started with a drop of water, drip, 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 and I think that's what happens to women. I'd like to stop eroding the confidence of women. We've got it in spades. That's um, four very, very cool things that you're hopeful for and and on, and I know that you'll be advocating for equal pay. I absolutely agree. This is about decision making. And you've said that for those of us who've grown up with sport, sport is about decision making in the moment. So yeah, it's one of the skills that you get very, very good at as a sports person. So yeah, let's make the decision. I interviewed Cindy Gallup for my other podcast last week. And you know, she said, Michelle, there's a very easy way to create equal pay you just pay the men the same as women. Absolutely. Accelerating investment in women's sport. Now, interestingly and controversially, you've said, and decelerate the investment in men's. And I think this is the equity play that is so often not well enough understood. And I don't want to be patronising listeners, but if we think about sport, and I often, this is the analogy I use. Imagine Usain Bolt, one of the fastest men on the planet, and Michelle Redfern lining up for a 100-metre sprint. Now, after you've picked yourself up off the floor from laughing at that, that visual, you would know that I haven't had all of the things that Usain has had to get me ready for that race. I have not run. I don't, I don't build for comfort, not speed. I haven't had coaching. I haven't had training. I haven't had the gear, the nutrition, whatever. So we need to say, well, okay, let's make this a fair race. So what we're going to do is give Michelle probably about a 95-metre handicap. <laughs> well, we'd probably give me some, yeah, just like the stall gift for uh, listeners across the world. The stall gift's one of our, our famous running races here in, in Australia. 
everyone starts, but they start at, you know, at handicaps, you know, like golf, everything. So with investment in women's sport, you're right, we need to really accelerate that investment. But at the same time, say we need to compensate for historical inequity by over-indexing on it, over-accelerating on women's sport and not over-investing and over-accelerating men's sport. They can just stay as they are for the time being. Don't at me, listeners. I know that there'll be a whole bunch of very animated views about this. This is not the zero-sum game. This is not women win, men lose. This is an equity play. So I think it's a really good call to action, Kerry. The third one you talked about, no quotas. Absolutely agree. Now, quotas on their own are a blunt instrument. But quotas, so you talked about the 40-40-20 rule. So what do we do around that? We create the environments where every human can be successful, but we've got to have representation. Representation matters. And at the same time, we provide this upskilling around 21st century leadership skills, which includes how to be an inclusive leader, how to be an inclusive colleague, how to create environments where all people can thrive. So I live for the day when we don't have to talk about quotas. But one of the great things right now for Kerry and I are in a similar age bracket. Well, I haven't got grandkids yet, but I know that if I ever get them, they have a world that has never not seen women playing sport, never not seen women umpiring or refing, never not seen the chair or the CEO who's a woman. They will come into a world where it is absolutely normalised for women to be everywhere where decisions are being made. You know, when we do get tired, that's the stuff we need to hang on to. The final one, Ah, oh, I'm cheering around confidence erosion because I get very, very animated about confidence. Uh, the word confidence, which is so often used in conjunction with women. The women, women are marinating in advice from magazines and Instagram and everything about how to be more confident. They are confident. You go and look at a two-year-old girl. And I'm thinking about my now 28-year-old girl who, when she was two years old, she had confidence coming out of her in spades. But you're right, it's that drip, 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 tone it down, play small, be polite. Girls don't do that, yada, yada, yada. So we've got to stop. As, as a society, we have to start looking at what are the messages we're giving girls and women from the outset about what they shouldn't to do. How about we celebrate what they do do? Celebrate their ambition, celebrate their drive, celebrate their confidence, just like we celebrate young boys and men's confidence. So that is a, an absolutely terrific, well, it's a terrific hopeful uh, hope that you've got uh, for the future. And I know that the work that you do with women on side and more broadly in your advocacy work in sport along with others is, is absolutely going to deal with that. So one final question for the women listening in, Kerry. You've got one piece of advice to give them and I know that this is a very broad question but what do you want to say to the women in sport listening in? What do you want them to hear and perhaps do right now? Begin. Just begin. If you see something, say something and just begin and follow your own path. There is no rule book. Just begin. The journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step, right? Mm, yeah, it does. And I'll, I'll add to that or I'll build on your begin. Please begin and know that we are there. We have your back. We are in your corner. There are so many of us out there who want to get around you when you begin. And I know, Kerry, you're one of those women who gets around other women, women on side and all, all of the other work that you do, you know, that outrage, that flickering flame that's a, a bushfire in all of us now around we've got to make it better for the women that come after us. We will be there to help all of those women who want to begin. Kerry Harris, Chair of Onside and lots of other stuff. Thank you so much for your time. And we have plenty of calls to action out of this conversation. And I think the main one for me is go to, to Women Onside. We'll have the, the links in, in the show notes for the pod, but have a look at Women Onside. Have a look at Elaine's list and really start to see where this advocacy work can take you and how you might get involved. So Kerry, brilliant to speak to you again, my friend. Thanks so much again. It's been a pleasure, Michelle. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the episode. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope that you got a lot of those actionable insights that I promised. Please check the show notes and michelleredfern.com for the companion article about my guest. 
I'd also love it if you could share the episode and the article to amplify the work of these amazing women who are working to level the playing field for women and girls in sport. I'll see you next week for another insightful interview. And if you want to move workplace gender equality from conversation to action, then give me a shout because that's what I'm good at. You can book a call with me over at michelleredfern.com. See ya.